Well, now um, it's my honor to introduce Dr. Chiu Chen Tong, Xian Tong Yao. Uh, Dr. Yao holds the prestigious uh, William Casper Graustein Professor of Mathematics Chair at Harvard University. He is also the director of the Institute for Mathematical Sciences for the Chinese University of Hong Kong and the Zerda and everywhere. Uh, <laughs> he, 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 he's renowned for inventing the mathematical structures known as Calabi Yao spaces. These are the foundation for string theory. Uh, I know on my campus we have a Nobel laureate lead a great a, a large group of team of people studying using his string theory to uh, use using his theory uh, theory to, to to explore the mysteries of the universe. In 1982, Dr. Yao won the Fields Medal. As you know, Nobel Prize don't cover mathematics, so Fields Medal give once every four years, so it's worth even more than Nobel Prize. And when he won that prize, he was only 32. At that age, most of us were still struggling for tenure. <laughs> uh, um, among his many honors is the National, National Medal of Science. Uh, in an article two years ago, the New York Times called Dr. Yao as the emperor of math mathematics. <laughs> so he's known not only for his mathematical genius, but for his passion to advance world-class science and mathematics in China. Dr. Yao's remarks will include the challenges of building a world university culture based on both Eastern and Western values of an appreciation for science, science and arts, and the inclusion of service to our society. Now, Dr. Yao. Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, I felt to give this uh, conversation here is like Ban Mun Long Su in front of uh, several uh, prominent educators. I learned a lot by trying to prepare for this talk. In fact, I was on the airplane yesterday. I'm reading the old history of the Chinese education system. To my surprise, I found out that the Chinese university went back all the way to Han Dynasty and I thought it was more, very small scale. But in fact, some of the university at that time has about 18,000 students and even grew to 30,000 students. And they taught a lot of interesting subjects, but largely on subjects related to Confucius. And this goes on all the way until Qing Dynasty. And it's always large scale, much bigger than what I have thought before. And this has a great deal of influence in the whole Chinese culture, but all relate to the examination system, Koji. And this kind of system has been fruitful, has been useful to promote farmers, to promote people in the rural area to climb up in the ladders, working for the government eventually. But on the other hand, it has been pretty much controlled by the government and is not necessary, the best way to promote knowledge, to create knowledge. The private system in China did exist. In Song Dynasty, especially the Su Yuan College system, which is pretty much independent of the government, although supported by the government by some research grants in some way also, they were able to think much more freely and the famous Song uh, Wen Li Xue is pretty much developed in that way. So I think this is a useful thing to reflect about the education, education system in China in all the years since uh, 2000 years ago. This is very much similar to the Western system um, where the church was pretty much dominating in the medieval period all the way until 18th century when the German universities start to look forward. Only at that time, truth was no longer given, but something to be sought after. And the university teacher, instead of teaching the old wisdom from textbooks, begin to educate and train the students in the art of discovering new truth, new <coughs> knowledge. And I think this is a very important thing that the Chinese university system should learn. 
And of course, we are all learning, they are all learning about it, but I think it's not a large scale yet. In an address to Peking University students in, in 2002, President Larry Summers of Harvard University said that the university has to seek to understand its contribution to knowledge over the longest period of time. Not only that, the university should take advantage of the opportunities to inspire and foster the newest inventions and to invest in ideas that are given, that are going to have the most profound impact, perhaps not tomorrow, but in a decade or a century from now. This is the faith in which universities in America are based upon. It has paid off exceedingly well. And I think this is something that our university in China should really think about carefully. We have been always trying to get something to be paid off immediately. And it's important that the university not only need to teach a large amount of knowledge to students, but also has to think for the society in a global manner. One should distinguish between the type of education that the society wants the university to do, but we should think about what the society needs. It's very important to avoid to respond to the market demand from the government, from the industry, or from the donors. Universities should have their own view and should not be pushed by all this by the government, by the companies, or the news media on what goals they should achieve. I think the university in China, by the turn of last century, in the early uh, 20th century, was, doing, was starting to reform. And at, at one point, namely during the war, where the Xinan Lenda or the Southwest University system was formed. It was a, one of the peak of the Chinese university system, where Peking University, Tsinghua University, and Nanka University were formed together. And I read the history of that period of time um, quite thoroughly. I think it was a golden period where the Chinese university was doing great and many reasons behind it. The students and the scholars, namely the professors, realized the great difficulty of the country are facing, namely being annihilated by Japanese, and they all unite together to work together, and they have experienced the great difficulty in the countryside because they came from the north, they walk, they travel in a great difficulty, way and they found many things they should have learned and they learned in that way. And they have a very good atmosphere and I would say they truly enjoy academic freedom despite they were supported by the government. And many important uh, scientists, important scholars were trained during that period of time. That was really a good model that I think Chinese universities could do and should still be able to do. But on the other hand, despite the economics has grown much better and everything seems to be in a better way compared with the period in 19, late 30s to early 1940s, we are facing many great difficulties which I'd like to mention. <coughs> 